Uh, as you know, on the platform, we believe very, very much in free speech and freedom of speech and believe it is a fundamental that is vital, absolutely vital to our way of life, to our democracy. And also it is fair to say that at the platform we believe that free speech has been under attack, not just in New Zealand but in Western societies in general for some time, for the reason perhaps that it threatens the narrative or people's real experiences, in my humble opinion, um, threaten the narrative of woke ideology. You cannot people, have people saying, well, hang on, critical race theory doesn't really work in the real world. Or maybe climate change isn't all man-made. Um, and to have freedom of speech and open political debate makes democracy work. One of the places where the most informed free speech occurs is in our academic institutions and amongst our, well, I guess, our intellectual elite, our academians. And for that reason, the Free Speech Union uh, has for a while been commissioning a survey of how free, in terms of speaking, our uh, practitioners of, well, our academic practitioners feel, people in our universities and tertiary institutions. They've just completed their latest survey and the results are far from encouraging. To discuss them further, we are joined, and on, in this instance, I think, talking on behalf of the Free Speech Union, by Professor Elizabeth Rata. Um, Elizabeth, lovely to have you with us. Welcome to the platform. Thanks very much, Sean. Thank you for the invitation. All right, the survey. Firstly, I, I just want to get the methodology right. Who takes part in the survey? Is it all academics or a select few? Um, it's conducted um, uh, um, academics throughout all um, New Zealand's eight um, tertiary institutions. And um, it's those who uh, choose to undertake the survey. Um, in fact, um, it does appear that some academics were loath to take part, um, fearing that, you know, concerned about um, the repercussions. But we what, certainly what? need many more surveys. Okay, so how many of our academics were surveyed and can we, and I'm just trying to get some base facts in place here before we progress further, can we say that the survey is statistically accurate to a relatively high degree? Um, it was undertaken by the Free Speech Union with the Korea um, Institute, um, who, uh, you know... Um, yeah, and they're certified <laughs> and they put so out stuff. They yeah, they are a certified market research and polling company, that's aren't right. they? Yeah, that's right. So as with all surveys, we must always be a bit cautious and continue to to um, undertake the surveys. But the trends are certainly there. Um, they come through not just through the survey, but uh, in um, people's experiences, in what we see in the media, in, in the response to um, the listener letter that I was a signatory to a couple of years ago. Yeah. So we know that um, from a, a variety of sources that there is a problem. Yeah. The, and, and so so just let, 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 let's just take it step by step. So the base result was, do our academics feel that they can speak freely in their institutions, yes or no? Was there a value score put on that? Um, no, they, they, they feel they can't speak freely. That's, that was really the results of the survey. Or that, let's say that there is a problem. Let's say there's a problem with academic freedom in our universities and we really need to know a lot more about it. Yeah. You know, what exactly is the problem? Okay, what so by what percentage, what percentage out of 100% feel that there is freedom of speech for them in their universities? So what, it's obviously less than 50%. Yes. Well, let, let's just focus on the one that um, I'm most knowledgeable about, which is was the question about, you know, people feeling comfortable about speaking um, about the Treaty of Waikini and yeah. colonialism. And at least one third of academics said every single university said they would feel not at all comfortable. Wow. Um, and 
almost half, 45% from Otago were not at all comfortable. So um, I think that probably takes us to the nub of the problem. The whole process of the indigenization of our universities is what I think um, is causing great disquiet. And that's the area I would like to see a lot of research undertaken in. Mm. I'd like to see surveys about that. So, Elizabeth, um, not only do we have do we have a climate of fear in terms of free speech, if we were look to look to one issue that academics feel most fearful about discussing openly and expressing their true views, it is the Treaty of Waitangi, issues of race or ethnicity. Yeah, I think that's the one that stood out. Yeah. And that's certainly the one, um, you know, in my experience, because this is an area I write about mm. and have done for 30 odd years, so this is the area I think is the most problematic and deserves the most sunlight is a result of that. Yeah. Now, Elizabeth, I would say that that is a problem, and, and we'll go into it a bit further, but the other interesting th result I looked at was freedom of speech depends, or, or the level of comfort you have as an academic, saying what you think in New Zealand, appears to be, from this research, very dependent on what your perceived political views are. And it would seem that a majority of people who self-identify as left-wing academics actually think that everything's fine. Yeah, that's right. And if we trace that back, it seems to me to be a problem um, that comes out of the idea that the purpose of the university is advocacy. Um, and if you think of the clause critic and conscience, it can be interpreted in two ways. One is that um, it's political advocacy. It gives an academic um, freedom to uh, advocate for his or her beliefs. The other one is that uh, other interpretation of critic and conscience is that enables people, to, uh, academics, to, to speak out about their research even if their research is revealing issues that um, are difficult for society to hear. Mm. So I think um, the notion of, of advocacy is a real problem. Um, and in my opinion, academics should not um, promote their political views, should not use their research to advocate for a particular political position. They should, should certainly use their research um, to um, investigate um, societal issues. This survey, therefore, um, Elizabeth, tells us that universities to an extent, by the data it provides to us, um, are not bastions of free speech, but they are, to a certain extent, echo chambers where speech that tends to the left of the political spectrum, that is more liberal, is way more acceptable than anything that is perceived to be with the right. That would tend to suggest our, our universities uh, if they tend towards anything, it is to being left-wing echo chambers. Uh, one of the pro I think a real problem there, Sean, is the role that, um, say, for example, critical theory has played and postmodernism has played in the social sciences in uh, particular. Yeah. Uh, there are two areas where um, the notion of the transformation of society is seen as part of the role of an academic. Now, I don't agree with that. I think the role of the academic is to investigate through argument and through evidence what's going on in society, not to advocate for mm. some form of transformation. Mm. Um, did the survey results surprise you? Elizabeth um, or not? No, no, I didn't, no. No, I think um, 
I think we, as universities, we really have to start talking about difficult things, particularly about decolonisation and the indigenisation of our universities, which um, I argue is um, subverting the very universalism, which is what a university is about. Yeah. That knowledge is for all people, um, mm. and it comes from all sources, um, it's, it's, it's the universal knowledge of humanity. Yeah, and it's interesting, isn't it? You might think we're just following global trends in New Zealand, but we are, and we have, have of late um, attracted the comment and sometimes opprobrium of world leaders on issues of free speech and scientific thought. And I'm thinking of Richard Dawkins in particular, who seems to have taken great umbrage at Māori Tanga being incorporated into sciences um, and tweets now regularly on the, what he calls this madness. Yes, I, I would agree with him. I think it's, um, it's extremely serious that Māori Tanga Māori is being brought in as equivalent to science, not just in our universities, but in our schools as well. And of course, um, we need to know about Mataranga Māori, but well, do it we? needs to be uh, in literature studies, well, like as, as we need to know, you know, in um, anthropology, in the history of, yeah. of ideas, in the history of humanity, we need to know what people in the past what traditional societies, how they have understood and lived in their worlds. So, yes, we, in anthropology, for example, we should um, study about, but the key word is about. I think we should study about Mataranga Māori, but we should not use Mataranga Māori uh, or traditional Māori beliefs and practices as um, a way to think. Yeah, that's a really interesting distinction you make, Elizabeth, and that is that <sighs> imparting knowledge is not the same as imparting belief, and it seems for so many young people or people involved in academia these days, and I say this from my general life experience and those I come into to contact with, people seem to be going to university to learn belief systems rather than genuine critical thinking. Um, and our universities are churning out people with, to a certain extent, universal world views on things, rather than a way to approach and engage with the world that is truly intellectual or enlightened. Yes, that's, that's the real problem. And of course, what we should be um, come out of university with is um, how to use the scientific method. So the scientific method, and I use the word science in its broader sense. Um, uh, the International Science Council refers to it as is it applicable to the physical sciences, social sciences, the humanities? And it's the approach which says um, if you're going to investigate something, then you test it, you use evidence, you use argument, um, you know, you, you have to justify what it is that you're saying. We have belief, and of course we all have beliefs, and it's really important we do, but beliefs are for, um, for our socio-cultural world where we... Um, Mm. have certain beliefs in order to belong to a group and so on. But the scientific method is what, um, it, it is what universities should be about. Mm. I've got a really interesting text in uh, Elizabeth from Renee, which I'd like to read to you. Sean, can you please ask Elizabeth if she has any thoughts on this issue extending to students? As a student, I personally feel we are more and more asked to regurgitate left ideology and to get marks ahead of thinking critically. Well, it's certainly very sad to say that I would see this approach as permeating the university, not just for academics, but for students as well. Um, the idea that, you know, as we've mentioned, that it's about belief rather than about ideas that must always be tested, must always be open to, um, to, to criticism and to sound argument um, supported by evidence. So yes, I think we, um, 
uh, that, that's my concern with indigenization and decolonization because it's the strategy for embedding Māte Ranga Māori or a be traditional belief system throughout the university to inculcate those beliefs in staff and students. Mm. Look, I'm also looking, I want to raise with you another issue because all these things, it seems to me, Elizabeth, tied together. There is a, a special review panel or independent panel was set up by the Law Society to review, and apparently this, this grew out of a concern about the way sexual misconduct complaints were handled by the Law Society. And a review group was set up which came up with a couple of recommendations around the Treaty of Waitangi, one of which has been re rejected, the other one which is going forward, would, would, which would make changes to the Conveyances and Law Practitioners Act um, to acknowledge obligations under the Treaty of Waitangi. And we had Chris Finlayson on um, who has been, you know, a Minister of Treaty Settlements and other things, and he says the Law Society has no obligations and lawyers have no obligations under the Treaty of Waitangi because they weren't signatories to it. And he made the point that this sort of change, and we do have the Law Society or someone from this group on later to talk about this issue, that without this critical thought, without this freedom of speech, we are making presumptions about people's legal obligations and other obligations in our society, which, to be frank, are simply not true. And are making people believe they have to behave in certain ways or comply in certain ways when it's all complete po uh, poppycock. And that seems to me quite dangerous, Elizabeth. Well, the whole business with, the treaty, with treaty revisionism um, the notion that there is a partnership, that the treaty has principles, this is all the politics of retribalisation from the 1980s. Um, there should be um, the, the insertion of the treaty into legislation has um, really uh, brought in this ideology, this, this po the politics of retribalisation deep into the heart of our institutions, which is a serious problem. And if we just have a look at the uh, 2020 Education and Training Act, it talks about um, universities acknowledging the principles of the Treaty of Waitangi. Well, in the first case, that shouldn't have been there. It's not the role of the university to acknowledge any um, political um, uh, ideology. But I've noticed in the last couple of years that word acknowledge has changed to honouring and committing, commitment and honouring. Um, this is very serious stuff because what we're being asked to do, not just in the universities, but in all institutions, um, as you mentioned, the law society, so, so those types of institutions and civil society now, this notion of honouring, of being obligated to the treaty, no. The treaty was a historical document in 1840 which suited the conditions of the time. What we are being asked to um, go along with today is the revisionist um, promotion of the treaty, a revisionist version of treaty politics which serves um, retribalization. Um, and this comes, as I say, from the late 1980s. So I am very concerned when I see any reference to the Treaty of Waitangi in any of our institutions. People are free in a liberal democracy to think what they want about the meaning of the treaty. But the treaty, as I say, historical document, those days are gone. The revisionist um, um, politics of the treaty well, if you want to hold those politics, then that's what you do, but not in our institutions. So I would like the references to the treaty taken out of all legislation. Yeah, OK. And you don't think it should be included in this recommendation from the Law Society. I might add a woman called Professor Jacinta Ruru is a member of the advisory panel to the Law Society. Are you aware of her? Um, yes, I am now. Professor Dudu was one of the authors of Her Pua Pua, which is the, um, in a way, it's the document of um, retribalists. 
um, promoting the idea of co-governance through the strategies of indigenization and decolonization. And she gets onto the advisory panel for a rework of the Law Practitioners Act by the Law Society, which originally set out to look at sexual misconduct charges. That seems odd to me, I'm sorry. Well, I would um, suggest that the Law Society needs to have a very close look at um, what um, uh, what ideology is being promoted um, in its society. Yeah, yep, I hear you. Well, look, I, I think everyone who thinks about this stuff, uh, Professor Rata, is disappointed at the results of, of this survey, of this poll of, of academics and their view of, of their ability to speak freely. What, to your mind, are just a couple of things we might be able to do to improve the results if we were to take this survey in a year or two years' time? Oh, goodness me. Well, it would involve a huge change because this um, pervasive um, control over thought, over expression, has been going on for since the late 1980s as part of the whole um, of, of identity ideology. And in New Zealand, it takes the form, main form it takes is um, retribalisation. Oh, um, Huge changes need to be made and what must happen is that university leaders must start speaking out. I think it's got to be led by university leaders, and not by junior academics who of course are concerned about their careers. But university leaders need to um, look closely at what, how they are justifying this. They are equating indigenization of the university with equity, but there is no relationship. Equity is a separate issue. Um, most in the um, legislative, one of the clauses of the legislation talks about, um, this is section 281, encouraging the greatest possible student participation by underrepresenting um, underrepresented groups. If they now, don't turn this round, yeah. Elizabeth, if our, our tertiary in institutions don't change this, do you think they you lose their moral authority or their position? As if you like, no, uh, you know, the position they hold in society. Yeah, I mean, that's, yes, yes, I think that's certainly the case. And um, another real problem will be uh, international reputation, which already is um, under threat. And if that international, if we don't rescue the universities and enable them to function as they should, you know, as the place for the, um, the, the development of knowledge, then um, we, we won't attract the top academics, we won't attract the best students. Now, New Zealand, our first university was the University of Otago, 1869. That's incredible. We have had such a long tradition of, of uh, commitment to, uh, to the university. Um, we've got to, we've got to rescue it. We've got to recover our international reputation as a place where, um, where universities are truly respected. Um, Professor Rada, it has been absolutely fascinating and enlightening uh, listening to you exercise your freedom of speech for the last half hour. I thank you very much indeed for joining us on the platform, and we hope, I hope to talk again soon. Thank you. Cheers. That is Professor Elizabeth Rata talking to a Free Speech Union survey that just shows that not only do less than half of our academics believe they have freedom of speech within their tertiary institution, the more those on the right feel even less, right? Right, so it, those on the left feel they can, everything's hunky-dory with them. It shows a political bias in terms of the application of freedom of speech in our tertiary institutions, it is most concerning, most concerning. And I thank uh, Professor Elizabeth Rata. Boy, she didn't pull any punches. And good, good that someone like her can exercise her free speech.